we'd certainly want to go across shouting, wouldn't we? We wouldn't want to doubt, we wouldn't want to question mark. Thank you, Hardy family. I've been contending for something. I'm not very popular for contending for it. But I feel that one of the big problems in our wholeness churches today is the songs we sing. That's one of the big problems. If only our singers would go back to start singing some songs that had some depths to them. Something that does something for us. These little ditties we have today. Calvinistic inspired most of the time. I'm glad for a real, real song that gets down into the depths of your heart and does something for you. Well, we may not have the biggest crowd, but I'll tell you what, we can have a whole lot of God. And that's more important than the biggest crowds. I'd rather be with ten that have victory than a thousand that don't know anything about it. I don't know about you. Amen. But I'm glad when the devil comes around, he tells you there's not many of us remember. The Bible said there's a number we can't number, can't count. So we're going to reach the saints someday. Praise his name forever. Amen. If you'd go out and advertise that the blessing of God is on the camp, I'm sure that somebody would be hungry for it. And I believe that God would do something for us. Stand with us, John chapter 1, verse 17. John chapter 1, verse 17. Father, help us this morning as you have helped already. For we are just man. We need to be anointed. We need to be quickened. We need to be stirred. We need, O oh God, thy presence to come upon us. Hide us behind the cross. Bless the word that thou hast given, and may it, Lord, do the work you intended to do for Jesus' sake. John 1.17 reads as follows. Very familiar text. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Thank you. You may be seated. When I begin to think of the plan of salvation, there is so many things that have to be considered. Certainly, we think first of all of the great love of God. That God so loved the world, a world that was in rebellion, a world that was in disobedience. A world that had no room for anything that was spiritual, yet God loved it. And then I go on to think of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. When sin had become so black and it become so deep, that the blood of Christ could go deeper than that stain has gone and brought deliverance. And I think of the wonderful work of the Holy Spirit, how he'll come and awaken us that are dead. For the Bible said we were dead in trespasses and sin. We had no feeling towards that which was spiritual, no desire towards that which was godly, <coughs> until we were awakened by the Holy Spirit and brought to Christ, and through Christ came to God. Yet John goes a step farther, and he talks about a little word called grace. He draws the comparison. He said Moses was given the law, and the law had its place. And Jesus Christ himself said that he did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. But grace does something about the law. Instead of it being written on tablets of stone, grace writes it on the fleshly tablets of our heart. Therefore, we do obey the law of God. But if you'll notice about the law, the law gave rules and regulations. And the individual that broke those laws had nothing more but judgment and punishment. There wasn't a law that could deliver them from sin. There wasn't a law that could bring them to the place of having freedom and liberty in the presence of God. But grace goes beyond that. For grace is a deliverance. It comes because God gives us an unmerited favor in his presence. You and I that do not deserve to ever stand in the presence of God, you and I that never deserve the taste of the goodness of God. You and I that really do not deserve to go to the kingdom of God have access because of the grace of God. When I begin to think about the grace, I couldn't fathom its depths. For I went through the New Testament to see how far the writers would take us, how far the Holy Spirit would lead us into this wonderful depths of grace. 
May I give you a few this morning for your consideration. First of all, I find in Romans 5.20, the abounding grace of God, that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. When I think of the shackles of sin, when I think of the chains of sin, when I think of the darkness of sin, when I think of the power that grips the sinner, then the satanic forces take over and rule that individual. We wonder how anyone could ever be saved. Sinking down, sinking in despair, sinking in disappointment, sinking in their shame and their remorse, headed towards a devil's hell. Sin on every hand seemed to just crowd in, taking away all hope, taking away all peace, taking away all real joy, giving them the thrills of the flesh that would not last very long. That individual living hopeless, without Christ, without God, in the world, separated from the plan of God. What a terrible picture. And that was the picture of every one of us. When you think back to that time before you were saved and the grip that sin had on your life, the habits of sin that controlled you, the desires of sin that led you, the lust of the flesh that caused you to be condemned in the presence of God. Was there any help? Then we read about the abounding grace. The grace of God that got down under us and lifted up and gave us a buoyancy so that we could come out of the mire and come out of the clay and come out of the darkness and come out of the bondage and come out of the sinfulness into the very presence of Jesus Christ who would deliver us from sin. And Christ came to give us that abounding grace when there was nothing we could do about ourselves, when there was nothing that we could do about our sin, when there was no hope for us by any other fellow man, there was the grace that Jesus Christ brought, offering to us a way out, offering us a way up, offering us a way in. What a glorious picture. And we must never forget the abounding grace of God. And remember those sinners that you know in your family, those that are your friends, those that you work with, who seem to be lost in a terrible, terrible state. And it seems they're getting worse and they're getting farther away. Remember that that grace can go farther, that grace can go deeper, that grace can get a hold of them just as it got a hold of us. For this is the promise of God. God does not have any favoritism, but whosoever will may come unto him. Abounding grace seems to have its great depths, and I'm glad for it. I can't comprehend it. I remember what one writer wrote, amazing grace. When I was lost, it found me. When I was blind, it gave me sight. When I was dead, it gave me life. That was abounding grace. Why would God favor us? But the word favor there has another adjective goes with Favor us so that we're accepted in the presence of God. God could never accept us while we were sinners. God could never fellowship with us while we're sinners. God could never come down and communicate with us as sinners. Sin had separated us from God. But his amazing, abounding grace brought us to the place where the sin problem could be taken care of in our life and we could be set free. But after you're saved... There are things come your way, just as Paul found out. There are things you'll never understand. There is going to be test and trial. Remember that the condition for discipleship was not a bed of roses, but it was denial and taking up the cross and following Jesus Christ. And sometimes he leads us on the mountains, and sometimes in the valley, and sometimes we're even feeling alone as we travel along. But we follow him, and through our Christian life, We'd have the enemy trying to devour us on every side. He'll fill our hearts with fear. He'll come to our minds and trouble us. Many times he'll even blind us that we cannot see what we want to see. But then Paul said, if we're afflicted or if we're tormented, if we're tested or if we're tried, his grace is sufficient. And that word sufficient grace takes us into a deeper level. It means to bring us to the place where we'll have enough, enough to make it. We'll not lose out. We'll not go back. We'll not go down. We'll not be defeated. But his grace is sufficient to meet whatever that need is. There's nothing can come our way that the devil can bring to our lives that the grace of God cannot take care of. But that word sufficient goes a little deeper than that yet. It means to bring us to the place where we have satisfaction and contentment. And Paul wrote about that. 
He said he found that he was contented in whatsoever state he found himself. Now I know when you're laying on a bed of affliction and the fever's racking your body and, and the aches and pains are going through your muscles and your bones that it's very hard to be satisfied in a condition like that and very hard to be contented. But he's not talking about that physical contentment. He's not talking about that physical satisfaction. He's talking about being satisfied in the Lord that you know that the grace of God is sufficient for you in that time when you can't help yourself, in that time when no one else seems to help you. When you've gone beyond the limitations of man, you have never gone beyond the limitations of grace, for grace will go farther and deeper than anything else that can come your way. And if ever we're going to make it, it's because of sufficient grace. And aren't you glad in these last days when so many things seem to be failing, and in these last days when it seems that the clouds are getting darker, that His grace is sufficient to take us through. We may have mental depression sometime, and the devil may try to suppress us, but thank God on the inside He cannot get there and tap us of the source that keeps us alive and well in the presence of God. And you and I are going to make it. Never forget that. There is a way through if you and I will just walk the way of grace. And we can be acceptable unto God in a bed of affliction. We can be acceptable unto God when our limbs no longer have their normal capacities. We may lose our eyesight. We may lose our hearing. We may even lose our speech. It may be a stroke will come upon us and somehow deform us. It may get to the place where we can never again raise our hand and say glory to God. But the grace of God will be enough in a time like that. Enough to keep the joy bells ringing. Enough to keep us under the presence of the Holy Spirit so that we can make it through. I cannot fathom the depths of grace. But I have to go a little farther for that still isn't enough. And in 2 Corinthians 9, 14, he talks about exceeding grace that indwells the obedient child of God. A surpassing, excelling, exalting grace. Did you ever th think about that? Have you ever got a real low in your life? You thought, everything's against me. Everything's going wrong. I wonder, I just wonder why I'm here. Have you ever arrived at that place in your life when it seemed that the promises seemed far off? When it even seemed that the sun had a cloud over it? We think about standing in the shadows Christ is never in the shadows, we're in the shadows and we find Christ when we're in the shadows because he's able to dispel them and take them away. But this exceeding grace, grace that went farther than the abounding grace. Could anything go farther than abounding grace? Could there ever be a measure of grace that was greater than that? That lifted us up out of the mire and out of the clay and brought us into the presence of God? Do you mean there's a grace that goes beyond the sufficient grace? The grace that's enough? The grace that will bring us contentment? The grace that gives us satisfaction? Something more than that? He talked about this indwelling grace. The indwelling favor of God. Now you may lose favor with some of your family because you take the straight and the narrow way. And they might think that you've gone off in the upper story. They used to say, when I was a boy, you lost your mind. And the preacher would get up and he'd say, we certainly did. We had a carnal mind that we were born with. It was rebellious. It was ugly. And we lost it one day under the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And took on the mind of God, the mind of Christ. Had a transformation instead of a confirmation. And what a great thing that was. And it's still very great for everyone. But now, while grace may be under you to lift you up, and grace might be around there to sustain you. How about the exceeding grace that abides in you? The favor of God on the inside of your spiritual existence. Down there where you're really you and the really me. In the inner man. And while the outer man is perishing, the newer man, inner man is gaining strength day by day by day. We talk about dying, and we talk about going to the end of the trail. But friend, 
we're really not dying and we're not end, going to the end of the trail. We're going to a glorious beginning like we never had before. And this inner grace is promoting our stretch toward the end of the race that we might cross the finish line and be victorious. But he didn't stop there. And in 2 Corinthians 4, 15, he talked about abundant grace that it might abound to the glory of God. Abundant means unexhaustible, never ending, without measure. I know that abounding grace is great. How far it abounds, I'll never know. But there could be an ending place when the Lord sees that an individual refuses to repent and he withdraws his spirit from them because the Bible did say he said, my spirit shall not always strive with men. And it may come to the place where the test and the trial and the burden is so great that while grace is sufficient, you may lose your grip on that sufficient grace and be succumbed to your test or trial. And it's great that it's exceeding. I'm glad that it's there all the time when you need it. But listen, he's talking about something else. A source of grace that can never be exhausted. If you live a million trillion years on earth and live obedient to the promises of God and live according to the word of God, there will always be grace for you every day. New grace, new grace, new grace. And regardless how many others tap it, it's still there for you. I'm afraid we don't realize that. Why is this sister over here blessed and this brother over here blessed and this one over here isn't blessed and that one isn't blessed? Yet they both live a good life and they're both abstaining from sin. It's what they're tapping. One attaps the abundant grace. The other tries to exist without that abundancy of grace. And you just can't make it that way. Just as your body has to be fed. Just as your body has to be strengthened. Just as your mind has to be rested. The abundant grace of God must come to the spiritual man and bring him to the place where he goes beyond himself and just relaxes in the abundance of God. Do you exist in that type of a condition? You know, so many of us today are trying to fight our own battles and using carnal weapons. And a carnal weapon doesn't always necessarily mean something evil, but when you get carnal, it means that you use fleshly means to satisfy yourself. You're going to use some fleshly means in just a little while when they ring the bell for dinner. There's really nothing spiritual about the food they're putting on the table up there. You're going to take care of the need for strength for existence through a physical needs. The word carnal really means fleshly. That's what it means. That which is of the flesh. And you're not going to eat spiritually up there. You're going to eat fleshly up there. But there has to be a time when you eat spiritually. There must be a time when you drink spiritually. There must be a time when you rest spiritually. And you do this in the abundant, inexhaustible grace of God. In the favor of God. Oh, Lord. You're my satisfaction. Oh, Lord, you have come to be my contentment. Oh, Lord, you are my blessing. And until we get blessed, David talked about that. Talked about thirsting as the young deer thirsted for the water brook. And although we get saved and sanctified, there should be a spiritual thirst for more and more and more. There's always a greater depth that we can go to. There's always a higher mountain we can climb. There's always something new, always something fresh out there for each and every one of us. We don't get stale. I think of one of the most precious songs we sing in our hymnology in the church. The cleansing stream, I see, I see. Not I saw, I saw. But today I see it. It's present tense. It's flowing today. It's doing its work today. It's keeping me sinless today. It's keeping me pure today. It's keeping me right with God right now. And that's the way grace has to be. 
The abounding grace must go beyond its abounding. It must go beyond its exceedingness. It must go beyond its sufficient. It must come to its place where it's abundant, where it's inexhaustible in our life. You can't measure it. Then in Acts 4.33, he talked about great grace. And said, great grace was upon them all. A power, a might, a strength. Did you know that grace gives you power? And grace gives you strength? Grace gives you might? A lot of people don't know that. God favors you. God brings you to a place of acceptability in his presence. And enforces you and reinforces you. So that you might carry on the message of Christ to a lost and a dying world. So many of our people are weak. So many of our people are timid. So many of our people seem to be on a low key. Now I don't mean just a loud noise all the time. Thank God the Lord loves noise. He loves a joyful noise. He doesn't love a murmuring and complaining sound, but he loves a joyful noise. But let's be honest with you. If you yelled and screamed and run and jumped for 24 hours, we'd soon bury you. Wouldn't take long. You'd just exhaust everything you had. You know that. We're human beings. Lord looked down at that crowd and said, he remembered they were just flesh, so I don't think he forgot about us, that we're just flesh. It reminds me of the little lady that went to the altar who was overweight, quite overweight. And she began to pray, oh, Lord, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me. The Lord did. He poured out heaven on her soul. She got up and she started running around the tabernacle. She made five rounds and six rounds. Now when she's going by, the preacher heard her say, Oh, Lord, stop blessing me or you'll kill me. You can't take it, you see. She was just too heavy to run too many more times. It was going to do something about her. Well, we have to learn some lessons sometime. But there needs to come that grace that gives us a strength, that grace that gives us a power, that grace that gives us might. Did you ever stop and think that the Jehovah Witness and the Mormons and all the false doctrines are empowered by the, the spirit of Satan? He gives them some type of power. They become very convincing. They become very strong in their approach. They become fearless as they take forth their false doctrine. You and I have to have that same type of a strength to take forth the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible said in Acts 1, when the Holy Spirit would come upon them, they would have power to become with. And we get that power through the grace of God. God bestows it upon us. We can't earn it. We can't buy it. But the Lord bestows it upon those that are qualified to receive it to do his work. So it said that great grace was upon them all. And the early church went forth conquering. The early church was accused of turning the world upside down. Somebody said to me, well, some of our churches have such a few. Well, every time you count 11 beside yourself, preacher, you have as much as Christ started out with. Did you ever stop and think about that? And he even made a promise lower than that. He said, if two or three of you are gathered together in my name, I'll be in there in the midst. He must have saw the wholeness age today when he said two or three. And gave us promise and courage to go on. But that 120 went out there so empowered by the Holy Spirit that grace came upon them. The favor of God came upon them. And read the lesson very much. And it talks about why the grace of God came upon them. It says, because they had no lack among them. And they held nothing back to each other. And they shared with each other. And they walked hand in hand with each other. And they were united with each other. And they had the presence of God in their midst. And we'll get back to the place where you and I start walking together. And singing together. And shouting together. And praising God together. And doing the work of God together. Instead Instead of dividing up and being separate all the time. <laughs> Some people are just like Pharisees. They pull their cloaks around about them and feel that no one has it but them. You ever have a crowd like that? They just isolate themselves. I want to tell you something. The Lord has called us to separation. There's no doubt about it. We have to be separated from sin, separated from the world, separated from unbelievers, separated from the cold and the dead. There's a great separation. But he never called us to isolation. 
Because when you isolate yourself, you die. When I was in the hospital, they isolated me a number of years ago. And nurses come in, had to have something on their face, and even those that came in have had gowns on them. I had had something happen to my liver. And it wasn't very good for anybody to get in contact with the food that I ate or something like that. In fact, it got so sincere, my wife wasn't allowed to kiss me. And that's pretty bad, you know, <laughs> when your wife can't even give you a kiss. But I was contagious, and they isolated me. A lot of our preachers, are, a lot of our Christians are contagious, and they're isolated. <laughs> and really, the Lord doesn't want any more like them. We have enough of them now. <laughs> do you ever stop and think why we don't see growth in some of our places? Because all we can do is produce what we are. And the Lord isn't blessed with what some is, so we don't want to add any more to them. And that makes a big difference then, doesn't it? God help us. But I'm wondering, do you have the grace of God upon you to empower you? You may not be in favor with the world. They weren't in favor with the world. They weren't in favor with the leaders of the world. There was even religious people that looked at them when they were called Christians. It was a, a mockery name. It was a smear on them. It was an insult to them. You're like that Christ. You're imitating that Christ. But they had the favor of God on them, and that made all the difference. And it took them over the top of all the rest. Amen. And it still will take us over the top of all the rest. <laughs> well, we have that. But James 4, 6 adds another term to it. But he giveth more grace. Now you mean, preacher, that I don't have it all yet because I got abounding grace and sufficient grace and exceeding grace and abundant grace and all the rest of the graces? Well, there's more grace yet. And this one now relates to our relationship with Satan. It said if we will resist the devil, he will flee. He said, if we draw nigh unto God, he'll draw nigh unto us and give us more grace, more favor. Has any of your children won more favor in you? Let's talk about it. You love that child, but when that child's obedient and that child does the things they're supposed to do, you just give them more attention than before. Why, they can persuade you about things they never could persuade you before. In fact, they can please you so well that you'll do for them anything they ask. That's where God wants us to get. That we'll please him so well, we'll walk so clean, we'll be so pure that anything we ask, there's no limit to it. You say, well, preacher, what do you mean? He said, ask anything in my name. Anything in my name. And I like back there what it's written by Paul. He said, the great God that's able to do above what you think and above what you ask, he's exceeding beyond any of our human comprehension. He said, according to the spirit or the power that works in us. And that makes a difference. We turn the fountains of heaven off. God never does. We close the windows of heaven. God never does. We have power. When we quit resisting the devil, we give place to the devil. We start to get worldly. We start to compromise, get indifferent. We grow dead and cold. Then God's grace no longer abounds towards us. He can't be in favor of that. He can't agree with that. He can't bestow himself upon that. I go around to churches and once in a while I'll get into a church that has drifted quite a far that one time was old-fashioned and I found something out well they may have a big Sunday school they have no one to preach to Sunday night some of them are closed and prayer meeting night is almost a thing of yesterday but when they held the line and, and it kept true while well, they were bubbling over and advancing at every line they said we'll let down the standards to get the world in well the world is so compelling the more you per uh, per uh, permit of the world the less of God you have. And when there's not the Spirit of God to draw you in, you can't have the grace of God in your midst. We don't learn some of these things. And our holiness churches are still holding the line. I go from place to place, and please forgive me, but I already see the little seeds that took the other churches down already beginning to grow in our midst, and we better wake up to the fact. 
And I don't want to get to the place this morning where I get negative. Only to tell you this, that whenever we adopt the style of the world, we lose the blessing of God. It does not work together. And I see some of the styles in our churches. Listen, they never came from the Bible. They came from the world someplace. Girls wearing socks over nylon stockings. There's no sense in a thing like that. God never promoted that. Ouch, preacher. The world did it. You know it did. Big ribbons in the back of their head. That's not of God. That's of the world. The world promoted all that thing. That didn't come from the Bible. That came from Hollywood someplace or something like that. Why don't we wake up to the thing when we see what we're doing today? How the little foxes are beginning to spoil the branches and eat them. You say, preacher, you're radical. No, I'm sensible. <laughs> I'm sensible. I, I have a garden back home, Brother Cope. I want to tell you something. And we must have, oh, 15, 20 roses in it. In fact, I just bought two this year. I'm very happy about it. Before I came here, the purple one bloomed. And my head had beautiful, beautiful purple flower. And I'm looking for the green one to grow. It has leaves on, but I've never seen a green rose. But they say this is a green rose. And it's going to have green roses instead of all the rest. I'm anxious to see it. Now, can you imagine me going and getting some big ribbons and tie them so I can't see the roses after they're on there? God gave a woman the, her hair, her long hair is her glory, and then you cover it all up so nobody can see it. <laughs> it doesn't make sense, does it? Well, I got meddling again. Please forgive me. I tried my best this morning to stay away from it for Sunday morning, but sometimes you just can't do it. But he giveth more grace. More grace! For you and I, so that we might glorify God. There's nothing more blessed to find a person walking in the light of God, obeying the Spirit of God, Amen. being one. Our brother said how much he appreciated the singers and the way they looked. Well, that's the way we were raised. Brother, Sister White and I, we had a lot of standards prepared for little girls and God never set them. Oh, we had it made up way back there. They'd wear stockings and... We'd never put a scissors in their hair, front or back or side or any place else and things like that. And the Lord never sent it. We have only boys. But you know, even the boys never run around with shirts off or short sleeves. Never while they were home with us. Amen. And the Lord blessed us. You'd be surprised how the Lord blessed us. Over and over again, the Lord just blessed us. Grace. Grace. The favor of God, the unmerited favor of God, being in the presence of God, communicating with God, having a good meal with God, having God feed your soul, have God providing your soul, have God protecting you, have God taking you through, and being happy while you go. I hear the expression sometimes said, when you get to the end of your rope, just tie a knot on it and hang on and let the Lord pull you through. But I want to tell you something. It would be pretty uncomfortable going through tied up like a knot in some of the holes you get yourself in. I'd rather think that the grace of God is able to make the, the, the hole big enough for us to get through or make us small enough to get through it. And that might make a big difference in our life. You say, well, how do you know, preacher? Well, listen. If God to take away the appetites of the lion when Daniel got into the den, he didn't take away the, the lion, he took away its appetite. That was the difference. God didn't take away the flames out of the fire. He just took away the heat and the burning and the consumption out of the fire. Let the fire blaze. It became useless. It became ineffective. That's what he did. Yes, and the lions became ineffective. Do you think he's able to make the things that the devil would try to devour you and I and upset us and cause us to go backward ineffective in our midst until we're able to do something? The Bible talks about subduing kingdoms. I heard the old typers say it. They felt like troopers and they were going through the walls and jumping the walls and having the victory. I believe the favor and the grace of God can give us that same victory today and take us through. Sure, I get to the place where we're pulling that big trailer around and tire blow or something to go wrong with it. We have it like that. But you know what? 
always when it happened God had someone there to help take care of the need that was the great part of that we weren't stranded we weren't abandoned God was right there at the time of the need I didn't need those folks when I didn't have the need the only time they were around is when we had the need somebody said to me well preacher how about it well I'm not ashamed to tell you you'd be surprised how God has provided at the Sally's department store and the Goody Willie's store a suit that'll just fit me proper or a pair of shoes just the time I need it. Amen. Say, it's too ashamed to wear those clothes? Absolutely not. If God give them, they're the best thing in all the world that I could have. Amen. You look at me very strange. I'm talking about grace. I think of that song when it says, He giveth more grace. When the burden grows greater. Somebody said, you're going to have dying grace? Don't know, I'm not dying yet. But if he took care of all the living grace, he's certainly going to take care of the dying grace. I can remember when I had my problem a couple years ago. The doctor came in and he said, uh, Reverend, he said, you're bleeding on the inside and we can't find out where. We want you to sign this paper. We're going to take you up to the operating room and put a hose down through your throat with a light in it and see what's going on down there so we can find out where you're bleeding. He said, now there's one thing I want to tell you. He said, you could die while we're doing this. You know that something could go wrong while we're down inside of there that would kill you. He said, you have to sign this paper so that we have the authority to do so and that there would be no problem. Well, I said, is there any other way? He said, no. I said, well, give me the paper. I'll sign it. And I signed it. It came time now to get ready to go to the operating room. And they come in and they say, we'll put a needle in you and that will quiet you down. You won't even know anything about it. Well, I found out one thing that after the needle was put in, not only quiet me down, but I couldn't even pray anymore. Something just took over. I was beyond all prayer, you know. But there was a calmness there and a gentleness there. And I said to myself in my last waking hours, as they were pushing me down the hall towards the operating room to do this, if I wake up, I'm going to see my wife and my children. If I die, I'm going to see my mother, dad, and all my family that's gone on. So I'm going to have a glorious reunion either way. And there was a contentment there. The next thing I knew, I was back in the room and everything was all over and all right. You say, was that dying grace? I imagine it was something like it. Something like it. I think of you today. You don't know what's going to happen this week. You don't know how it's going to happen this day. Before this day is over, any one of us can be in eternity. Before this day is over, we can get the most upsetting news that we could ever hear. Something could go wrong any time in this whole world we live. But if it does, and we're right with God, there'll be grace. And his grace will be abundant and sufficient and exceeding and great and more and any other adjective they tried to use back there. It hasn't changed. The Lord is still the same. He's still on the giving end and you can be on the receiving end. He'll still take care of you. Like he never took care of anybody else before. If you'll just let him. No wonder the writer said, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Is there a sound of grace? Must have been that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. Twas grace that brought me safe thus far. And grace will take me home. You notice in closing, John did not talk about angels singing, shepherds going to a manger bed, wise men following a star and bringing gold and myrrh and silver and, or uh, frankincense. He talked about Jesus bringing something and he brought us grace and truth. And thank God for that grace. Stand with me, will you please?